few days ago, I shared 15 tips and secrets for the early game of Tears of the Kingdom. Since then, I've of course been playing the game non-stop, and with some help from what's being shared around on various social media, as well as the comments of the last video, I've got another 15 here. Not just for early on, but useful things to know as you start to progress through the game. I've tried to keep this list as spoiler-free as possible. It doesn't include any late-game strategies, items or characters, and of course does not include the game's story. But this video will cover some mechanics and locations that you won't have seen unless you've begun your journey through Hyrule and started to uncover its secrets. So, as always, if you're trying to remain completely unspoiled on this game, then I'd give this video a miss. Ultrahand is perhaps Link's most powerful new ability, and works like a souped-up version of Magnesis, a Sheikah rune from Breath of the Wild. With it, he can pick up almost anything around him, rotate it in 3D, and stick it to another object. Rotating pieces and building with Ultrahand can seem a bit tedious at the beginning of the game, but gets easier the more you practice with it. But one tip that's been a huge time saver for me is a very simple one that the game doesn't make very clear. You can automatically flatten whatever object you're currently holding by just pressing the ZL trigger once. This makes rotating pieces so much quicker and so much simpler, and I wish the game made this trick clearer for new players. Another Ultrahand shortcut is breaking pieces apart from one another, primarily done by wiggling the right stick around. But if you have motion controls enabled, you can just shake your controller for the same effect. Wings are Zonai devices that glide in the air, allowing Link to sail through the skies without using stamina, at least for a while. After a certain amount of time, wings will despawn, but this doesn't stop us just using another. It's possible to deploy and climb onto another wing in mid-air, which means Link can glide massive distances without ever needing to touch the ground. To do this, make sure Link is paragliding, but that you're not touching the left control stick to move him in any direction. Open the inventory menu and drop a wing from the Zonai Devices tab. Hold up on the left stick, then press B or plus to close the inventory screen. Press B once more to drop the paraglider and fall onto the wing, which should now have been placed right underneath Link's feet. This trick can be used to hugely extend gliding trips. A new wing not only lasts for another minute or so before despawning, but lets Link recover any stamina he's lost. Like Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom allows you to select between two modes for the game's HUD. Normal, which displays your hearts, your D-pad options and currently selected ability, the minimap, and your weather, temperature, and sound gauges. But you can also change your HUD to Pro Mode, which removes everything. Pro Mode is how I've been recording footage for these videos. Unlike Breath of the Wild's Pro HUD, which still displays hearts, Tears of the Kingdom's Pro Mode shows nothing with hearts only appearing temporarily if you're damaged. Tears of the Kingdom is a game of three layers. Breath of the Wild's surface sandwiched between the mysterious floating sky islands above and the terrifying depths below. Each layer has its own full map, which can be accessed by pressing up or down on the D-pad from the map screen. However, your mini-map, found in the bottom right of the screen when not in pro mode, remembers what layer of the map you most recently had open, letting you, for example, have your mini-map show the surface while you're exploring the depths. The mini-map, of course, still tracks Link's location and the direction he's facing, but can show the terrain of whatever layer of the map you choose, which is very useful for navigation. 
In the last video, I mentioned that every cave on Hyrule's surface, and on the Sky Islands, is home to a Bubble Frog. A strange creature related to the Lord of the Mountain, Satori, that drops a bubble gem when defeated. It's possible to highlight every cave in the surrounding area by offering fruit to the altar at a cherry tree, but there's another way to find caves, by following bloopies. These are tiny, glowing, rabbit-like creatures that drop rupees when shot, before running away and disappearing. But try and make a note of the direction a bloopy runs in when it sees Link. They run towards the mouths of nearby caves. Just like Breath of the Wild, Tears of the Kingdom allows Link to shield surf. By jumping, then pressing Z, L, and A, Link will pull out his shields to ride down slopes or grind along rails. However, just the action of pulling out the shield causes Link to perform a double jump, which can be used in some circumstances to reach places you normally wouldn't with a single jump. It's not game-breaking, especially in Tears of the Kingdom where Link has access to all kinds of crazy methods to cross gaps, but it can come in handy in some situations. And things get even better when we add Fuse into the mix. For example, fusing a Zonai spring to a shield creates a springboard. Performing a shield jump with one will bounce Link high into the air, but not as high as he'll travel if he shield jumps with a bomb barrel shield, which gives him a huge boost upwards. Finally, this clip from the animated show is actually a mechanic in a Zelda game. Experimenting with shield fusions can lead to all sorts of brilliant inventions, like fusing a minecart to a shield will create a makeshift skateboard, allowing Link to shield surf even on relatively flat terrain. It's worth just messing around with whatever interesting items you encounter. Often, a shield fusion can create an incredibly useful tool. I mentioned in the last video how Tears of the Kingdom includes a cookbook, which automatically records any meals Link cooks or finds during his adventure. But it turns out that this doesn't only make remembering ingredients a lot easier, it also streamlines cooking itself. If you want to cook a certain meal, you're now able to select one of the ingredients, then choose Select for Recipe. This option will open up the cookbook, just choose the meal you plan to make, and the game will automatically select the rest of the items from your inventory, if you have them. Tears of the Kingdom's weapon classes each have a special ability. Not the individual weapon's perk, like long throw or attack up, but the actual weapon class's bonus, displayed in the weapon quick select menu in blue. Keeping track of these abilities is important. Some classes of weapon have incredibly powerful bonuses that you can use to your advantage. For example, Knight's equipment comes with the Desperate Strength perk, which doubles the weapon's strength if Link is on one heart, and Royal equipment comes with the Improved Flurry Rush ability, making the weapon hit far harder during, well, a flurry rush. Fusing a material to a weapon is permanent, you can separate the two from the inventory screen, but this will destroy the fused material, leaving only the weapon behind. But there is a way to unfuse a weapon without losing the material. It's a service offered by Pelison, a Goron child who is located in Tarrytown, in the Akala region in the northeast of the map. For a fee of just 20 rupees, Pelison will break apart a weapon from its fused material. Very handy if you make a mistake, or want to recover a valuable fuse part like a gemstone or a strong monster horn. There's another weapon tip that the game doesn't immediately tell you. Just like in Breath of the Wild, 
A certain type of octorok, the rock octorok, found primarily around Death Mountain, will inhale any weapon you leave in front of them. In the first game, they would inhale rusty weapons and spit back restored blades. But this time, they're even more useful. These Octoroks will take whatever weapon you feed them and restore it to full durability, as well as give it a random buff, like attack power up, for good measure. It's worth noting that this can only be done once per Octorok per Blood Moon, but as far as I know, this is the only way to restore weapon durability in the game, so it's definitely worth knowing. Just be careful when it spits a newly sharpened blade back at you. Tears of the Kingdom doesn't include Link's original Sheikah Slate runes, so that means no Cryonis. But in the sequel, Link has enough options to just make do without it. Throwing an ice elemental material, like a sapphire, ice fruit, or white chew jelly into water will cause some of it to freeze and form an ice platform. But you can go one step further. You can then fuse this block of ice to a weapon to create an ice weapon, which you can swing to create new floating ice blocks. Eventually, the ice will break off the weapon you fused it to, but you can just fuse to another ice block floating in the water. Puff shrooms can famously be fused to your shield, and as Aonuma shows us, will confuse an enemy who hits it to the point where they lose track of Link completely in the fog, and can be dealt a free sneak strike for big damage. Well, it turns out that puff shrooms are exactly as powerful as they look. Fusing one to an arrow, or just throwing one into a group of enemies, causes all of them to lose sight of Link, which can be used to escape difficult combat situations or cheese the enemies with sneak strikes. Puff shrooms can be found pretty commonly growing in the depths, and they're more than worth using. Just like Breath of the Wild, drawing your bow while in midair causes Link to enter bullet time. The world slows around him and allows time to line up the perfect shot. However, Tears of the Kingdom has changed this mechanic. Instead of your stamina draining continuously while in freefall, the meter will now only drain when you actually loose an arrow. There's no rush anymore. Unless you're in danger of actually hitting the ground and cancelling the bullet time, you're able to take a lot longer to aim your shots this time around. I mentioned in the previous tips video that the depths are like a dark world, an inverted version of Hyrule found deep below its surface. And this is exactly how the terrain of the depths is laid out. It's a copy of the surface map above it, only inverted so hills and mountains on the surface are pits and canyons in the depths, and vice versa. And water on the surface, like lakes, rivers, and the sea, are impassable walls down below. By selecting which layer you want to see displayed on your minimap, it's possible to use your knowledge of the terrain above to navigate the depths. The depths are not easy to travel through. It's pitch black, crawling with monsters, and it's filled with gloom. Giant pools of the stuff cover the ground, sometimes forming huge lakes that are difficult to cross without losing a lot of hearts. That is, unless you encounter a stall horse. These skeletal steeds can be found either being ridden by a stall coblin or just by themselves and can be ridden by Link like a regular horse. Only, instead of avoiding gloom like their living counterparts, stall horses can just gallop straight over it, making them one of the best options for travelling through the depths. Thanks for watching this video. 
Hopefully at least some of these tips will be useful to you and your adventure through Tears of the Kingdom's Hyrule. If you like this video, leave a like or subscribe if you haven't already for more Zelda content. A huge thank you as always to channel members, especially Myth Tier members. Cheers guys and I'll see you next time.